Um, myself and Mrs. Souza have worked to organize this along with a lot of your peers here. Uh, it takes a huge group effort to make this a success. So please remember that when you're watching this and respect their uh, efforts. Thank you. Uh, we just wanted to let you know this year's theme revolves around National Foreign Language Week. Our theme is Find the Missing Piece. Um, we will be watching presentations that revolve uh, around the themes of culture, language, music, poetry, um, and many other things. We really think you're going to enjoy the presentation uh, that your students um, have put on for you. So enjoy. We just wanted to give you a little bit of background on TED and how TEDx DHS began. Um, two years ago, myself and Mrs. Souza took a group of students to the TEDx uh, presentation over at the Zyterian Theater here in New Bedford, and um, the kids received it quite well. And so we started talking about doing something here at the high school in order to give students an outlet to show all of their knowledge in various areas that they don't necessarily get to use during the regular school day and in areas that they do get to use during the regular school day. So we decided to create our own independent TED talk and we just wanted to let you know what TED actually stands for. So the ideas of TED are technology, entertainment, and design. And so therefore, the topic matters run the gamut and really allow people the opportunity to find what is relevant to them. And I'm sure hopefully you've used these in your classes at this point. I know that my students have certainly used TED Talks in their classes. And so now we're going to begin with the first presentation. Okay. okay, our first presenter is our only presenter who is actually uh, a veteran of the TED Talk uh, TEDx DHS stage. She was actually the only presenter who was here last year as well. And ironically enough, she was our first presenter last year too. Uh, and so her TED Talk is on international studies and globalization. So Victoria Costa is an 18-year-old senior here at Dartmouth High School. After school, she dedicates much of her time to her duties as president of the National Honor Society and to the efforts of their fundraising and their charitable organizations. She is also a member of the Harmonics Group, which is our Dartmouth High School a cappella group, and she intends to begin her studies in international relations in college when she goes there next year. Please welcome Victoria. As seen throughout history, the world constantly changes. And political scientists and historians today have noted that the, the world is growing increasingly interconnected. Well, gotta find out where this is going. Okay. <laughs> this increasing international interconnectedness is known as globalization. And originally, globalization was a term that was used when describing the interconnectedness that arose because of trade patterns, but it's come to encompass a lot more. Today, it also describes the pattern of social change that has risen due to international interconnectedness. Gotta get used to this. Okay, humankind can see globalization occurring in everyday life, and one of the most prominent examples of globalization today is the modern day Olympics. Beginning in the late 1800s, the Olympics became a way for different countries to showcase a, a certain degree of power in the global arena. And this was a key aspect of how they would run themselves, especially when discussing national isolationism and 
to a degree, nationalism. What society has seen today, however, is that countries aren't necessarily d demonstrating how much power they have in the Olympics. It, the, the Olympic Games have sort of grown to showcase a certain level of national pride. And through international events like the Olympics, we can see that it is possible to have nationalism while still maintaining international ties. Unfortunately, one of the greatest criticisms of globalization is that it results in a loss of culture. And it's true because as the world becomes increasingly globalized, some aspects of culture are lost. Events like the Olympics, however, have the ability to actually maintain or enhance certain aspects of native cultures while maintaining these international connections. Globalization has a way of bringing people together like never before, especially through the increased use of technology. When events like the Olympics take place, this interconnectedness can actually showcase certain international issues that aren't brought to light otherwise, especially when certain countries take isolationist point of views. The Rio Games last year, for example, brought up a number of issues that gained international attention. Pictured here is 19-year-old Margaret Rumat Rumar Hassan. She's from South Sudan, and her first Olympic run was last year in the 200 meter. Now, South Sudan is a country that's only five years old and has been ridden with war since even before its creation. Rio 2016 was the first time Margaret had the opportunity to represent her country in the Olympics after it was admitted into the Olympics by the International Olympics Committee in 2015. And South Sudan wasn't the only spotlight on the Games either. The 2016 Summer Games in Rio was also the first time that the Olympics had ever had a team solely comprised of ref refugees. These 10 athletes came from Syria, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Ethiopia, and trained in Belgium, Germany, Brazil, Luxembourg, and Kenya. Ultimately, their display of athleticism was not only a showcase for themselves, but it also drew international attention on an issue that was prominent last year and continues to be an issue today. Now, even though Brazil was contributing to making history last year, the, the Olympics also showcased some of the issues within the country itself. And many of these issues are actually seen in other developing countries too. For example, when international events like this take place, the host countries are usually expected to undergo a process of self-improvement, self especially in the realm of infrastructure. And one of the things that ended up happening in Brazil last year was because it was a developing country and because it's so expensive to host events like these, some of the infrastructure wasn't completed by the time that the games began. And for example, um, the Olympic Village, which is where all of the competitors stay during their time at the Olympics, wasn't completed. And the Australian team actually had to stay in a hotel for a little bit while the games began because their rooms weren't finished. And one of the other most prominent issues that Brazil faced during these games was the extremely high level of water pollution, especially in waters that were used for sporting events. In March of 2016, so this was just a few months before the games began, a study found that the microorganisms, the harmful microorgan microorganisms in the water in Brazil were 1.7 million times more dangerous than those found in the waters off the southern coast of California. So if athletes were exposed to this water over long periods of time, they faced the possibility of serious intestinal damage, um, among other issues, but that was the most prominent. But concern for the environment is one trait of globalization that's worth noting because it shows a level of concern beyond that of national borders. And globalization has a lot to offer, uh, 
but it's very important to note both the positive and ne negative aspects of it. Brazil is one of the BRICS, the five major growing economies in the world. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa formed a coalition of the fastest growing economies in the world, and so they all support each other in a way, and this shows a certain level of economic prosperity while unfortunately also displaying some level of disparity. Two weeks ago, I was in Kolkata, which is the capital of India's West Bengal state. I saw a city where one side lives in extreme poverty and the other side lives in wealth. I spent time learning about how the country has been affected by globalization especially through the increased use of technology. While in India, I was able to witness development and human progress as it was taking place. And there's this popular idea of social Darwinism, which is the idea that the most powerful people and the most powerful countries will be the ones that succeed and the ones that inherently progress. I like to define human progress a little bit more loosely because there are multiple ways for humanity to progress, as we've seen. People and different cultures progress in different ways. The outgoing world order shows that some nations, the ones that have been superpowers over long periods of time, are actually giving way to some nations that have been suppressed. What we're seeing is this new world order where developing countries are beginning to have access to the global stage. And whether it be through something like nationalism, which is a little bit more of an abstract idea, there isn't really much concrete evidence or support for it, or, something, or through something a little more physical, like different methods of transportation, people are becoming increasingly interconnected. And whatever your opinion on globalization may be, it's impossible to deny that it's happening. Two, di two days ago in class, we were having a really casual discussion, and so I have a very, I have a, I have a small sized class, third block, and my teacher, Mr. Apperson, gave us a little quote in a, in a very casual context, but it was something that I thought was so, so profound that I asked him to repeat it, and I told him I would put it up here. <laughs> um, so he said, cross-cultural, Interaction and exchange are some of the most important aspects of advancement and progress in history. And this is true. Human interaction is inevitable. When we try to avoid it, we lose a sense of purpose. If we are to remain culturally active while still progressing, we should look to the developing countries that are doing it as, as we see as right before our eyes. Um, they are maintaining their own cultures while progressing with the developed world around them. Globalization is the key to determine what the future of humankind will look like. We have seen that it is possible to maintain our own cultures while still embracing international ties. And if this wasn't possible, we wouldn't be seeing this guy in the front of, the, of a riverboat on the Ganges on his iPhone. <laughs> Um, that's just, tradition is possible to maintain while we are still looking towards progression. And hopefully, in the future, we'll be able to maintain this because we still have a lot to learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I hope that you, you know, further look into the concept of globalization and the implications that it has in society. Our next talk is actually associated with globalization um, because the students that came up with this talk, um, actually one was in my AP Human Geo class and another was in my World class and we had talked about some of these concepts uh, in the class itself. So our next pair of presenters uh, and this is the first year that we've allowed students to present in pairs because uh, last year we were kind of not going to do that, but this year we decided to go for it. 
And so our next pair of presenters are going to present on the topic of fair trade. And a fair trade is very significant to a variety of different sectors of the economy at this point. So our two presenters are Amanda Ladino Saunders and Viv Vieira. So Amanda Ladino Saunders and Viv Vieira are juniors here at Dartmouth High School. Amanda works at Marisol's, where many of you and uh, you know a lot of the Dartmouth public, you know, spend their dollars, which is good. Uh, and she has one of her coworkers at Marisol's actually inspired this topic because he is from Guatemala, and he began to tell her about his life back in Guatemala and the low quality of, and the lower standard of living that was practiced there. So Amanda spoke to this coworker, Fasto Zunux. I hope I said that correctly. And she learned how fair trade had changed his life. And she was talking about fair trade as she had learned it in our class and really became very interested in the topic. And so Fausto found some sort of hope for the potential future of his home country of Guatemala. So Amanda was so excited by this topic that she decided to write about it for her AP English research paper and in turn spoke to her friend Viv and really talked to her about the topic and educated her on the importance of fair trade. And from that, they decided that they would put together this TED Talk. And so together they came up with their favorite phrase, which is, fair trade is good. And so this will be the topic of their TED Talk today. So please welcome Amanda and Viv. If I were to give all, all, th all of you $3, the price of one American coffee, and I told you that's all you and your family could live off of for the rest of your life, how long do you think you could last? Think about the luxuries you have to give up now. You fare better in reality than most of the people in less developed countries who work on farms. These workers get $1 a day, and that is what they live off of, not only them, but their families. That's why fair trade is vital. It's vital for their survival. It's vital for a humanitarian issue. Many people know me as a chippy girl. I work at Marisol's Cafe, a Latin American cafe in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. One day while I was at break with my coworker Fausto Zunix, who was raised in Guatemala, he told me of the five years of education that he had received to learn how to read and write, because this is a sad reality for many kids raised in less developed countries. They are raised to work, not to learn. This angered me, and I thought back to AP Human Geo when I learned a term called fair trade. Fair trade is a trade of products which are priced accordingly so that profits and adequate wages can coexist. These profits are from farmers and companies directly cooperating together. An individual fair trade farm is called a fair trade community. These are located in less developed countries, but is not exclusive to these less developed countries. When you have a few uh, fair trade communities together, they offer a premium that, Im that improves the uh, lives of the people through the environment. Premiums are the environmental products and economic projects that are produced from the fair trade products' profits. Premiums do not subtract from the workers' wages. Such projects can be used for better education, community improvements, and sustainable methods. Sustainable methods are the methods of farming which deplete the environment of the least amount of nutrients possible. Popular community improvements in the past have been cleaner drinking water and more access to luxuries. But not only does fair trade ensure that the environment is taken care of, it also ensures that their workers are taken care of through ensuring that their safety and happiness is uh, seen to. For example, there is no child or slave labor allowed on a fair trade farm. Additionally, these fair trade farms also ensure that these people will get better education. They receive their core education more so than what they would usually receive on other farms. This also enriches their resume when you look at it because they've gotten such uh, classes as soil research, science, and others. All in all, it makes them better qualified for promotions as well as better job positions. Such job positions are divided into five categories in the economic sector. The primary category 
sector jobs are farming, the secondary sector jobs are manufacturing, tertiary sector jobs are services, quaternary sector jobs are education, and quaternary sector jobs are science. Such job positions can be received from promotion or they can be hired for the specific occupation. These jobs are not exclusively for males and female enfranchisement is encouraged in fair trade communities. This women's empowerment leads to many benefits socially due to women and men receiving the same promotions as well as the same wages. In fact, within a fair, within a fair trade community, 25% of the workers there are indeed female. Of that 25%, 43% work in agricultural, which was to be predominantly male up until then, as in these less developed countries, these women were expected to stay in a domestic sphere. Female enfranchisement has been known to affect the DTM, or demographic transition model. The demographic transition model consists of birth rate, death rate, and the measure develop of development in an area. Female enfranchisement has been known to lower the birth rate. Recent studies have proven that females with jobs tend to have less children, which is probably to balance family life and career life in order to provide for their family financially as well emotionally. The medical technology that is received in the high level in fair trade communities lowers the death rate and increases life expectancy by lowering infant, infant mortality rate. The development levels in fair trade communities is high due to the modern ways of living, interacting, and working. As you can see on our chart, when females are enfranchised, it lowers the dependency ratio. The dependency ratio is how many people are labeled as dependents upon their government in an area. This, also, this proves that when females are empowered, it doesn't just affect just females, it affects the entire social uh, structure of the area. The HDI can be affected by the dependency ratio. The HDI Human Development Index takes into account education, income per capita, and the life expectancy at birth. The education in fair trade communities can go up to a college level and can qualify students for scholarships. The education offered also increases the literacy rate among the area. The wages that are sustainable in fair trade communities increase the income per capita. The medical equipment, clean environment, and access to necessities offered in fair trade community also increase life expectancy. The human development index, demographic transition model, and dependency ratio are all components into converting a less developed area into a more developed area. But fair trade doesn't benefit just that social aspect. It benefits the environment as well as the economy. When you are in a fair trade community, you are encouraged to do what is called sustainable farming. This helps to maintain the health of the soil and prevents soil erosion. Soil erosion is detrimental to farmers as it prevents it, uh, them from growing the same crops in the same soil season after season. This also reduces pollution by 100%. Additional to how, uh, changing how it is farmed, it also changes how businesses run. It teaches businesses how to negotiate their wages, how to negotiate benefits, how to negotiate hours. But more than that, fair trade shows these this entire community, all of the workers, how to get out of poverty. It gives them the tools to get out of the situation they're in, so they are not de solely dependent upon fair trade aid. While all of the products are sustainably produced and all follow environmental standards, they are not all organic. One of the most well-known well fair trade products is coffee. However, there is a variety of products offered, such as spirits and wines, cocoa, seafood, sugar, tea, body care, clothing, and many more. Supporters of fair trade are plentiful. However, some that stand out are Jim's Organics, which sells fair trade coffee. Dunkin' Donuts has fair trade espresso beans. Maine Roots has fair trade soda and soft drinks. The Republic of Tea, well, it's no guess what their fair trade product is. And lastly, Jerry Greenfield, who is the co-founder of Ben and & Jerry's and has been an avid supporter of fair trade since the very beginning. Not only have the numbers of supporters increased in recent years, but so has the number of sales. In fact, since 1998, Seafood sales of fair, fair trade seafood sales have increased by 896%. S 
sustainable methods and the environmental safety practice in fair trade communities have the potential to reduce 15 to 18 percent of pollution that is, that is developed from non-sustainable method using farms in developing countries. Why should you support fair trade? There is one con that comes up year after year when discussing fair trade, and that is the misconception that fair trade products are of low quality. This comes from the idea that if the profit is high and the wages are high, the production quality must be lower to compensate. However, this is not true. The increase of sales directly contradicts this. People buy what they want. They do not buy shoddy work. If this was the case, they would not be buying so many fair trade products. In conclusion, fair trade products are safer with their staunch laws on labor and better as they empower people. It is beneficial as a whole, not only to the farmers in Guatemala and all the workers in less developed countries, but to the people sitting in front of us. And we can make a difference if we buy more fair trade products because they are accessible. Fair trade equals fair lives. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, Amanda and Viv, for shedding some light on a topic that shows you not only that you can do the right thing, but also make a profit doing the right thing. And our last presenter for this first block presentation is a student who is all about being Greek. Okay, thank you, you know it's Noah. Uh, <laughs> and so therefore, he is really going to focus on his own personal Greek culture and Greek ties to pretty much enlighten you in terms of the impact of Greek ideology, Greek language, Greek culture, Greek tradition on your life too. So our next presenter is Noah de Rossi Goldberg, who is a junior here at Dartmouth High School and currently the vice president of the junior class. Noah strives to obtain academic achievements so that he may lead a successful school career and eventually become a medical professional. He is an avid debater and a lover of politics. Noah is also president of the Greek Orthodox Youth Association at the St. George Greek Orthodox Church here in Dartmouth. He has, been a, he has been to Greece multiple times, which he'll share with you, and is currently working on learning the language of his Greek ancestors. He has decided to do this talk in order to spread the word about the importance of Greek culture in our society and in society in general. Noah is very excited to do this today. Uh, so please welcome Noah. Ella. Give me a word, any word, and I show you how the root of that word is Greek. How about arachnophobia? Arachnophobia comes from the Greek word arachna, meaning spider, and phobia is a fear, phobia. How about kimono, you might ask? Kimono, 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 kimono. Aha, kimono comes from the Greek word kimona, meaning winter. So what do you wear in the winter time when it is cold outside? A robe, robe, kimono, there you go. Now, I'll answer all your burning questions now, because I know there's many. One, yes, we do spit on people for good luck. A little gross, but it's OK. Two, yes, we probably spend hundreds of dollars in our lives on plates we accidentally broke at weddings. And three, no, 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 no. We do not use that much Windex. We use olive oil. Hello, my name is Noah DeRossi Goldberg, and I am a Greek American. I first escaped to Greece, my homeland, at the Ionian Village summer camp. There, I dove headfirst into my culture and opened up the, a portal into the richest and most beautiful culture out there. Am I biased? Possibly. Am I right? 100%. And the best thing about being Greek is I don't have to travel 7,000 miles just to experience my culture. The presence of Greek culture and language in society today is immense. 
It's the foundation of our language, government, and modern way of thinking. When you think of hyperbolic character traits, you think of the Greeks. When you think of strong warriors, you think of the insurmountable Spartans. When you think of brilliant minds, you think of the ancient Greek philosophers who revolutionized the modern way of thinking. Now, Greece did and still does have some flaws. <clears throat> Economy, <clears throat> sorry, a little sick. But that, that does not change how influential they are to America. Ambidextrous, diameter, monotone, prototype, philosophy, all of these words have something in common. Can you name what it is? They are all words never used in the vocabulary of the TV show Keeping Up with the Kardashians. Oh, and they're also all rooted in Greek. Math, science, and even basic English vocabularies are all influenced by the Greek language. Now, I'm no native speaker of Greek, and I'd be lucky if I say something other than church words or how to go to the bathroom. But that doesn't mean anything. Because just being in contact with the language on a daily basis expands my vocabulary, my English vocabulary. Words with Greek roots are easier for me to understand and learn because I'm around it all the time. So it is my dream for more and more schools to teach Greek so that we may not only learn yet another language, but become more proficient in our own. Language is something that ties us all together, no matter where you're from. So it's an important thing to learn. An expanded vocabulary means you can express yourself in more ways with more words. So now, we're going to have a quick Greek school lesson just to teach, teach you guys the basics of the Greek language. Say you're walking in the horio or the village, and you see a friend. How would you greet them? First, you say, yasu, meaning hello. So repeat after me, yasu. There you go. This is usually followed by the word tikanis, meaning how are you? Say it with me, tikanis. Now let's put it all together. Yasu, tikanis. There you go. You just said your first Greek sentence. Pretty cool. Now, another major part of the Greek culture is the faith, the Greek Orthodox faith. Over 98% of citizens in Greece are Greek Orthodox, the majority of whom are committed to their faith and attend church weekly. And this level of commitment to the faith is important in showing the priorities of the culture. We celebrate family, friends, and faith. We dedicate ourselves to being good Orthodox Christians so that we may live out our lives in peace and tranquility. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the thing that each and every one of you knows and loves, the food. Gyro and souvlaki, spanikopita, tiropita, all of this deliciousness comes from good old Helada, or Greece. Food is a top priority in Greece. In many cities, you can kiss being married goodbye if you can't whip up some homemade tzatziki or fry some hot lukamadas. And Greek American food is a cuisine widely praised by the culinary world. It's a combination of traditional recipes and modern innovation. Now, as my, my yaya always said, echochaste tavga keta kalathia, meaning the American language has. Oh, wait. I'm pretty sure I just said I lost all of my eggs in baskets. <laughs> oh well. What I was trying to say is the American language has been developed around the basic verbiage of the Greek people. Our culture, the American culture, what we all pride ourselves on for being unique, it displays common threads with that of the Greek culture. And the significance is this. The presence of Greek language and culture in America today is immense. Without the Greek culture, America would resemble an old couch in your grandmother's living room that has some sort of distinct odor. You can't really tell, but you're pretty sure it's dog breath, but you don't want to say anything because it's kind of rude. Now, this is an exaggeration, of course, but it is based in truth. There truly are aspects of America that are only here because of Greece. So think about this. 
next time you go get a gyro at the local Greek festival or have to write an essay on the importance of Socrates. I would tell you all this is 100% meaningful. But hey, what do I know? It's all Greek to me. Efkaristo. for coming and participating in our TED Talks. Um, as you few don't know, TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Uh, and throughout the world, the presentations revolve around these topics. Uh, we wanted to bring to you at Dartmouth High School an opportunity to experience this. Uh, we started last year and we continued this year. Uh, our theme this year is Find the Missing Piece, and all the presentations will revolve around that from culture, music, food, uh, technology, uh, and many more. So we hope you enjoy uh, what your um, DHS students have put on for you today. Really impressive of their work. Okay, our first TED Talk of the second block is titled Flavors of the World, which is about food and its cultural meaning. Emerson Dugolinski and Molly Emmett are both juniors at Dartmouth High School. Emmy loves history, while Molly is a dancer. Both recently became acquainted with TED Talks and enjoy these inspiring stories. Emmy and Molly feel taking part in this experience is challenging and then to move outside of their comfort zones. Both ladies love food, so they have decided to combine their love of food with their love of learning and created this collaborative TED Talk on how food is a large part of our culture throughout the world. Please welcome Emmy and Molly. We as humans in the 21st century spend so much time finding things to separate us from one another that we lose our sense of unity. We try to destroy anything that holds us together. To quote James Beard, food is our common ground, a universal experience. Food is our only permanent aspect that holds us together as humans. It's no secret that food in its own entirety is known to build upon relationships and bring us closer together. Whether it be cooking with someone or sharing a meal together, there's a certain intimacy that exists. When you, cook a, when you cook with someone, whether it be a friend, a family member, or a partner, there's opportunity for banter, laughter, and enjoyment within the undertaking of a creative and appetizing project. On the other hand, when you simply share a meal with someone, a bond can be formed subliminally through chemical reactions in the brain. The complex compounds found in food can stimulate the brain to produce endorphins such as serotonin and dopamine, which create a feeling of happiness and relaxation. Foods ranging from chocolate and strawberries to pasta and seeds can trigger the release of these neurotransmitters. And when you engage in a meal where serotonin and dopamine levels are raised, it can lead to attributing that feeling of happiness with the person you're with at the time. This, in effect, can increase relationships as well, since your brain can begin to associate pleasure with a certain person, place, or activity you're with. So we know that the process of eating and creating food together is successful in establishing connections, but what happens when you begin intermingling cultures? There are many aspects of culture that we lose as we grow older. We change the way we dress to bend and fit society standards, and in doing so, we let the parts of us that are visible disappear into mainstream culture. With food, however, it's not as easily forgotten. We remember the traditional cooking that we're introduced to as children and the recipes that are brought in at significant times in our lives. We obtain a small fracture of new cultural influences this way, integrating them into our personal cookbooks as we go through life. Exposure to new cultures through food is probably one of the easiest ways to develop an interest in a foreign land. Food alone is simple to humans, a basic survival necessity that can double as a luxury. Food is something we come in contact with day in and day out. 
It requires no hard work or thinking in order to understand. With food, you simply eat, indulge, and enjoy. Food allows us to form our own identities. To quote John Anthelm Brillant Severin, tell me what kind of food you eat, and I will tell you what kind of man you are. This association that we really are what we eat can become an attribute to what culture we possess. Symbolically, we construct ourselves by what we eat and what we don't eat. Eating is immensely personal and can communicate our beliefs, social backgrounds, and experiences, all things which possess culture. And by dining with others, we in turn share who we are in our personal cultures. This basic action of eating can help bridge the divide between cultures. Local communities may fail to fully represent the vast range of foods that different cultures have offered, but as you travel to larger populated areas and increase your knowledge on what's out there, you develop a curiosity on what lies beyond your grandmother's kitchen. But have you ever stopped to think, where does our food come from? Many times we fail to realize the diversity that lies inside our pantries. But the simple ingredients that we use to cook within our own homes often have origins from other countries all over the world. When you delve further re and research it, it can be quite surprising to find out where some of our crops come from. Sometimes food with heavy significance to culture's signi signature dishes comes from an entirely separate continent. For example, tomatoes with strong ties to Italian meals actually originated in South America. It's something we don't think about often when we're in the middle of a meal, and although it may be unexpected, it begins to make sense when you consider geography. To give some perspective, we've listed the relative origin centers for some foods in terms of location around the world. To name just a few, North America is home to many fruits, primarily berries, such as strawberries, blueberries, and cranberries. Central America has maize, avocados, and palm oil. And South America fosters pineapples, quinoa, and potatoes. On the other hemisphere, we have Europe with pears, oats, and hazelnuts. Countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea with dates, lentils, and barley, and Africa with coffee, watermelon, and sorghum. Asia is the most diverse in terms of crops and has the largest amount of origin centers in comparison to other continents. Because of its large size, many countries within it have different climates which permit for different growing tendencies. Crops can vary as you cross from one sector of Asia to the next. Central and West Asia have cherries, spinach, and almonds. East Asia has oranges, kiwis, and lemons. And South Asia has bananas, cinnamon, mangoes, and many, many more. Regardless of race, religion, or heritage, the art of food can be shared and appreciated by everyone. No matter what language you speak, food is universally loved throughout every corner of the earth. And in those corners, the food you eat can give you insight on the specific geography. Due to climate, environment, governmental structure, growing seasons, and advancements in technology over the years, different cultures have different reasons as to why they eat what they do. Food is a major player in differentiating cultures within and between countries. Throughout history, traditional foods were kept to their mainland or the region they belong to. But now recipes and restaurants are popping up out of nowhere, and bl the blending of cultures through food intake has changed from a plane ride to a simple trip down the road. Claudia Rodin, an Egyptian food writer, saw the blend of food culture before her eyes during the Suez War. Rodin noted that in Egypt, recipes were never shared and said they were passed down directly through the family. But that all changed in 1956 when the war erupted. As Egyptian Jews were forced to leave their homes, their memories stayed behind in the recipes that they owned. Once relocated in London, Rodin spent most of her time in the Duet House, where people would pass through from all parts of Europe. On Friday nights, the house would fill with many different people, and quickly, strangers became familiar faces, friends even. And food was a common theme there. With the drastic change, old recipes served as comfort for those who fled, and as they became more acclimated to their environment, a true blend of cultures began to take place. Meeting many different people from many different cultural backgrounds, Rodin began keeping a collection of the recipes that she encountered, not wanting to lose them. And for her, it was more than just an exchange of ingredients. It was a bonding experience as well. To quote her, even now, whenever I cook, I think about how I got the recipe, who gave me the recipe, and what their story was. Nearly a decade after her family fled Egypt, Rodin's cookbook on Middle Eastern cuisine was published and has been since credited with introducing foods like tahini and falafel, sumac and tabbouleh, cumin and cardamom to the UK. Along with her Middle Eastern book, Rodin has also published cookbooks revolving around Spin Spanish, Italian, Jewish, and Mediterranean dishes, broaching unity between these cultures. We see small versions of this bridging in everyday life. 
Although Americanized, many restaurants cater to and offer a specific cuisine. Italian food is represented in Olive Garden, and Panda Express is fast food Chinese. Although they certainly are not spot on in their traditions and recipes, the idea of culture is still there. This access to other cultures has become easier than ever before. In Dartmouth alone, we have 35 places to either dash or dine. They range from American breakfast and hibachi. After you leave Dartmouth, you will grasp more options, and as you leave Massachusetts, even more accurate representations and food is presented to you. This sharing of culture through this necessity as humans has made the learning of other cultures almost mandatory, and we can all taste the flavors of the world without leaving the comfort of our own country. Thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>
There are many newer poems which cover the relevant topics of today, such as racial injustice, social media, and the new generation of Americans. There's a poem out there for everyone. Poetry also needs to be introduced to students in a way that poetry doesn't become a chore. In my freshman year English class, I was introduced po to poetry through a well-known contemporary poet by the name of Billy Collins. Here's his poem, Introduction to Poetry. I asked them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out. Or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Now, in this poem, there is a very important message. Poems shouldn't be read just to find a deeper meaning. They should be read when you want to read them and when you want to enjoy them. So why should you enjoy poetry? Well, poetry may be a bigger part of your life than you think it is. As I had mentioned earlier, poetry and music are like sisters, especially when it comes to songwriting. This past year, Bob Dylan, the famous American songwriter, ended up winning the Mo Nobel Prize in Literature. The lyrics behind your favorite song or rap may actually be poems with a little music and a beat in the background. Here's a list of some very influential poets. Um, we have Ed Edgar Allan Poe, William Shakespeare, Sylvia Plath, Maya Angelou, Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson, Langston Hughes. You probably recognize a lot of these poets. Now, I want you to look at the next list of names that I'm going to put up on the screen. Now, at first you might be laughing and you might not see a relationship between the two lists. However, these people are also poets in their own way. They also use rhythm, rhyme, and vocabulary <laughs> to convey a message and emotion to the reader. Even Shakespeare used a type of rhythm in his sonnets called iambic pentameter, which uses the stressing of syllables to give the poems a song-like effect. Uh, here is Shakespeare's sonnet number 18. Um, that's the first line, shall I compa compare thee to a summer's day? And I'm going to read that again, but emphasize every other syllable. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And you can see that it gives it kind of a sing-song effect. Apart from music, the film industry also loves a good poem. Some of you are probably familiar with the popular show Breaking Bad. For the trailer of its final season, the show had Brian Cranston, who plays Walter White, uh, recite the poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley. One of the episodes was also named Ozymandias after the poem. I'm sure that if you keep your eyes open, you'll find other odd places that poetry enters your life. Poetry doesn't have to be boring or difficult to read. If you find the right poem you're interested in, you may actually like it. Just because you don't like one style of poetry doesn't mean that they're all bad. To those of you who hate poetry, give it a chance, and I promise it won't bite you when you read it. Thank you. We hope you're inspired by that and hope to include poetry in today, tomorrow, and the future in your lives because it does touch the soul. Our next TED Talk is on the fascinating topic of how Earth relates to other places in the world. Hannah Chamberlain is a sophomore at Dartmouth High School. She plays the violin in the orchestra and runs cross country in the fall. 
Hannah is very interested in math and science, and especially the outer space, and hopes one day to become an astrophysicist. Hannah will be taking, talking about seeing Earth from space. She hopes to show people a unique perspective on the Earth that they have never seen before. Hannah hopes that her TED Talk encouraged her fellow students to open their minds to the vast expanse of our universe and a place in it. Please welcome Hannah. What do you see when you look up at the night sky? Some may see the vast unknown that surrounds our tiny world. Others may see constellations. People have looked to the stars for thousands of years, but it took thousands of more years for people to start looking back at the Earth. Looking at the night sky allows us to get a unique perspective of our universe that makes some realize just how small we are. But looking back at the Earth can make people feel small as well. Looking back at a planet surrounded by the blackness of space, looking back at continuous pieces of land with no borders, looking back at the place that every human being calls their home. We didn't gain this new perspective until about 70 years ago. One of the first photographs taken of the Earth was taken by the Explorer 2 balloon in 1935. When this photograph was taken, the balloon was still in Earth's atmosphere, so you can see the curve of the Earth, but not the blackness of space. This photograph is obviously in black and white and not as detailed, but it just started to give people a new perspective that they had never seen before. The first photograph taken of the Earth from space was taken in 1946 on a captured German V-2 rocket. This photograph was taken from 65 miles above Earth's surface. Again, this photograph is in black and white, but this time you can see the blackness of space and the clouds in Earth's atmosphere. After 10 years, this gave people a whole new idea of what Earth looked like from space. Just a few years later in 1948, a group of American soldiers and scientists used a captured German V-2 rocket to take the first photograph of the Earth from 100 miles above Earth's surface. This is also in black and white, but there is a lot more detail in these pictures. There was no panoramic technology at the time, so they took many smaller pictures and then pasted them together to make what looks like one continuous picture. The next major breakthrough in space exploration came with the Apollo missions. These missions provided a new set of photographs of the Earth from deep space. The goal of the Apollo missions was to land Americans on the moon and safely return them back home. Also, people were looking to establish their new technology in space. We focused on the moon at first and not looking back at the Earth, but now the pictures that we gained of the Earth during this, these missions might be some of the longest lasting impacts of the missions. In 1968, the Apollo 8 crew were the first humans to take a photograph of the Earth from deep space. This was the first manned mission to the moon. They didn't land, but they just orbited around, and this picture became known as Earthrise. This is the first time that Earth was seen as a small sphere in the vast expanse of space. It's credited with the start of the environmental movement because it showed how fragile Earth was and how lucky we were to have a planet that provided us with the building blocks of life. In this picture, you can see the vibrant Earth versus the desolate moon in the foreground. In 1972, the Apollo 17 crew took the first photograph of the South Polar Ice Cap. This photograph became known as Blue Marble. In this photograph, you can also see the, the entirety of the continent of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, and this is possibly the most reproduced picture in history. It's made into posters, t-shirts, and even pillows. This picture is in much greater detail than any of the pictures before it, but like the others, you can see all of Earth and the blackness of space behind it. In 1990, we gained a whole new perspective of the Earth. The Voyager 1 spacecraft took this photo out beyond Neptune, and it became known as Pale Blue Dot. Can you find Earth in this picture? I would be surprised if you could, because only one pixel in this picture is planet Earth. This is the last picture taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft before its cameras were turned off, 
and it began its interstellar mission. Today, Voyager 1 is the farthest human-made object from Earth, and it's still communicating with Earth on a regular basis. Since spacecraft can travel so far now, we are their photos show us how small and insignificant Earth is in the universe. Many pictures before this one focus on the details of Earth and not the small role that Earth has in the greater unknown. This is one of the few photographs that captures this small role. One of the astronomers working on the Voyager 1 mission, Carl Sagan, wrote a book inspired by this image, and he entitled his book, Pale Blue Dot. When reflecting on this picture, he said, that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everybody you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. Since astronauts have been going into since astronauts have been seeing the Earth from space, this has had unexpected effects on them. The most widely known effect is called the overview effect. This is an experience that astronauts go through when they see the Earth from space for the first time. They see Earth hanging in the blackness of space with only a paper-thin atmosphere sheltering every living thing. This changes astronauts' perspective, per perspectives of humans' place on the Earth. Now, if everyone could just go into space and see the Earth from that perspective, would we have so many conflicts? Would people be so closed-minded? Would people start to work together as a community rather than working and solving problems on their own? Well, since we all can't go into space, I'd like to show you a short video of what astronauts see from the International Space Station and what causes the overview effect. In this video, you will be able to see the paper-thin atmosphere that separates Earth from space, you will be able to see hu humans' impact on the Earth because of the lights from the cities and towns. You will be able to see thunderstorms, auroras, and even the blackness of space and the stars beyond the Earth. It's important for people to feel small once in a while, to feel like they aren't the most important thing all the time. Today, I hope that you've gained a new perspective of our planet Earth, and I hope that you've realized that no matter your race, gender, ethnicity, or religion, that we all have one thing in common. We all call this pale blue dot our home. Thank you. Wow, how cool is that? Hopefully we'll continue to learn more about space and Earth and um, progress with the technology that we have. Okay, our last talk for block two is on the pilot, which is an exciting new technology dealing with languages. Hannah Carvalho is a sophomore. She is a cheerleader and a member of DECA. She is participating in TED Talks because she wants to expand her horizons and it feels it's a good public speaking experience. The TEDx she is presenting will discuss how emergent technology 
especially the pilot, can help break language barriers in many different fields. The pilot is an earbud which translates languages as they are spoken, allowing two people who are speaking different language to converse quickly and efficiently. This new invention is a step towards a long-term change in the different, different cultures and people interact and promise to be extremely useful in schooling, traveling, and in the medical field. How exciting. Please welcome Hannah. What would you think if I told you that there was a way for you to understand any language you hear at the same time someone is speaking it? For those of you who are multilingual, this might not seem very far-fetched. And for those of you who are not, this may seem like a superpower or a lifelong dream of yours. But this dream is actually a reality. Sorry, I don't know how to work this very well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the Pilot. The Pilot is a pair of earpieces which stream music, work as a personal phone assistant, and most importantly, translates languages as they are being spoken. Next, you will watch a short video that kind of explains the making behind the Pilot. I came up with the idea for a translator when I met a French girl. That's really where the story starts. I was on vacation and I met this girl. It was difficult for us to communicate because she didn't speak English very well. And even when we tried to find a solution, like using some translation app to communicate, it was horrible. Look, if you and I are speaking and our phones are in our face like this, forget it. This is a wall. We're out of this real world interaction. But this, in your ear, puts us right back in it. LD, uh, put this in your ear. Je mets ça dans mon oreille? Yeah, put it in your ear. Comme ça? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me in French? Ah, il vaut mieux entendre en français. Oui. Et je peux te, je peux entendre parler français. Yes, I can hear you talk French. But this is awesome. But how you do it? Yeah, it's translating. It's translating. This little wearable uses translation technology to allow two people to speak different languages, but still clearly understand each other. Simply put. When one person speaks, the other hears it in their language. Developing the pilot has been an intensive process. Our team has been working on it for over two years. Andrew is our original co-founder and oversees product development. I'm an electrical engineer and expert in manufacturing. We also have a mechanical engineer, software engineer, PhD in machine translation, as well as an industrial designer. Our wide breadth of experts has allowed us to develop a product from the ground up. We wanted to create something that hugs the curves of the ear without being obtrusive. Something snug but fashionable to wear. In the process, we just decided to throw in an extra earpiece for wireless streaming music. That means the full system includes two earpieces and its accompanying app. It's from the app itself where all of the languages are uploaded to the earpiece. It's kind of an end-all solution for the traveler or the international professional. That's what we're doing here at Waverly Labs. It's simply the most advanced communication wearable. This Indiegogo campaign helps us finish what we started. We can get the earpieces along with this portable charger manufactured and delivered within a year. The app works on its own if you just want to use the app for basic translation. And we'll have the app out by late summer first for our backers here on Indiegogo. But for the full experience, you really want the earpieces too. It's the dream, you know? A life untethered, free of language barriers. It's just that it's no longer a dream anymore. It's real. So the pilot will include many different languages, such as English, Portuguese, French, Italian, Polish, Mandarin, Chinese, and many more. The pilot costs 249 US dollars, and the pre-orders will be shipped in May of 2017, so two months from now. Now the question is, so what? What can we do when we have this type of technology available? And the answer to that, is finally break language barriers in many different fields, such as education and the medical field. I'd like you to imagine that you are sick 
or in pain, and you're trying to communicate to your doctor what you are feeling, but they don't understand what you are saying. Well, this is a sad reality for many patients around the world. According to the Joint Commission, individuals whose care is inhibited due to language barriers are at increased risk for poor outcome. This is no surprise, because if you cannot efficiently communicate with your doctor, how are they supposed to treat you to the full extent of their ability? This leads to many cases being mistreated or misdiagnosed. Now you may think, well, that's why we have interpreters. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. According to one study, in 46% of emergency department cases, no interpreter was used for patients with limited English profici proficiency. This means that nearly half the time, no interpreter is there to help the communication between doctors and their patients. Another field where there is a tremendous, it, tremendous issue with language barriers is in education. Uh, the number of students who don't speak English at home are on the rise. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, the number of children between ages 5 and 17 who, don't, who speak one language at home and a different language at school has increased from 4.7 million in 1980 to 11.2 million in 2009. These numbers continue to increase as the number of immigrants and refugees come to our country seeking a better life. And with this better life, it includes education. According to a 2012 report by the American Psychological Association, Latino students who spoke one language at home and a different at school were at increased risk for dropping out or graduating late. Now this is true of students who speak any language different at home than at school, not just Latinos. Basically, this is because the students not only have to learn a new curriculum and culture, but also language, and that proves too difficult for many of them. This device, the pilot, will help students learn in their own language, and that means they will be less stressed and more receptive to new ideas, which will make them more eager to learn, and they'll be able to do more with their education and further it and be more successful overall. Now, this will help in many different fields other than just education and the medical field. One example will be in politics. The United Nations already has similar devices, and they use that to allow world leaders from all over the world to communicate efficiently, like aside from their language barriers. This could also be beneficial in business deals, whether it be foreign affairs or trade agreements, but even opening up a bank account at your local bank. And travel, for obvious reasons, you can travel just about anywhere now and communicate with the natives there. And lastly, this will benefit relationships, and not just romantic relationships like with the French girl, but any interaction between two people who speak different languages. Now, I think this is one that hits home, hits close to home for many of us. Uh, coming from a Portuguese background, growing up, I would always see how my Vavos face would light up when she's put in a situation as simple as a grocery store clerk being able to speak to her in Portuguese. When people understand you, it changes the way you communicate. It changes, it makes you feel good when people can understand what you're trying to say. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, former South African president and civil rights activist Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to a man in his own language, that goes to his heart. Now, although the pilot will be ideal in emergency situations, that's not the only thing it can do. It will also encourage people to further their education and use this device to be more exposed to a language that they're trying to learn and be more comfortable with the pronunciations of this. So not only is it helping us communicate, but it's teaching us how to communicate. Now, if you only get one thing out of this TED Talk, I would like it to be that this technology will allow for anyone to speak to whomever, wherever, whenever, without sacrificing their own culture or language. And with connections like that, what barriers can't we break? Thank you.